Now, today, we thought that we were bringing you two remarkable and inspirational women of courage and conviction, but one of them has actually gone AWOL. We're not quite sure what's happened there, but um, we're having difficulty at the moment locating Ashton Applewhite, which means that I'm going to have more time to talk to our other speaker, Linda Burney, which I'm delighted about. I first met Linda many years ago when I needed the advice of an Indigenous consultant for a documentary that I was making about crime writer Arthur Upfield. And I was very lucky when Linda said yes and navigated me through the protocol and sensitivities of using archival material. So it's lovely to see you again, Linda. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Linda is of Wiradjuri and Scottish descent and is the Shadow Minister for Families and Social Services and Preventing Family Violence in the Federal Parliament. Prior to that, she was the first Aboriginal woman to serve in the New South Wales Parliament, and she was also the first Aboriginal woman elected to the House of Representatives in 2016. And I have to say that I have always admired the very measured way in which Linda speaks, no matter what the issue. And I think that that measured, very considered tone that she brings to everything adds an extra level of dignity to her public role. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to do a kind of um, an audit, if you like, of where we think we're, uh, we're at at the moment in terms of attitudes to ageism and what we think, what you think, Linda, is shifting in the right direction and what you think the areas of concern are. Um, there's a definition that I came across this week, which came from a report from the UK called Aging Better. And I thought it was quite useful in terms of ageism because it said that ageism is a combination of how we think about age, and that's mm. the stereotypes, how we feel about age, which is the prejudice, and how we behave in relation to age, which is the discrimination. But I also really like the definition that says that ageism is the only prejudice that we have against our future selves, because it actually highlights how ridiculous it all is. So um, I thought I would start, Linda, by asking you to tell us whether there um, was a particular older woman in your life um, who acted for you as, as a mentor. Um, thank you, Carolyn, and uh, you are on Barrag country, um, in Badigal country. Um, I'm actually in my office in Cogra. We uh, are considered essential workers, so go figure. And, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been uh, challenging with the 13 weeks of lockdown being able to come in to the office has been um a bit of a godsend to be honest with you i'm so i'm so organized it's ridiculous <laughs> but uh thank you so much for that introduction and the, and the acknowledgement about uh the importance of how you present information and um also uh, what that can actually give you uh, in terms of your public profile. I think it, it serves you well. And it really goes to the heart of what you've asked me, Carolyn. Um, one of the things that I have made sure of in my um, electoral office is a diversity of people employed. And what I mean by that is not just from a, a what, ethnic background but two of my employees are in their 70s and uh, they are fantastic and in fact Di who is one of those people will be uh, running from all the women that the webinar is starting but if you can join us we still love that sorry Linda <laughs> it's obviously going to be a wild ride um, maybe people could mute. Um, so I, I think it's really important to have that experience, um, that dignity, um, and I have been very deliberate, Carolyn, and to the network in terms of employing people from a variety of age groups. 
And I think that, uh, and I know it will come to it, that ageism is the great unsaid and unwashed in Australia. Um, and what's really interesting, and you know this, uh, is that in the, in the Aboriginal world, uh, it is getting older and more mature is a great positive. Exactly, and, yes. And in, in fact, the, the role of elders is absolutely fundamental uh, to the way our culture, our um, knowledge, uh, our behaviour is determined. And, um, and I think it's, a, it's an incredibly, it's one of those things that I wish the rest of this country would um, come to understand and adopt. And to go directly to your question, was there someone in my life? Well, there was, of course. Oh, there were many, many people, and there, there are still many people, but probably uh, I was raised by my great aunt and uncle. Uh, they were born in the 1890s. Uh, they were in their mid to late 60s when they took me on as a three month, one month old baby, I'm not quite sure how old. They were brother and sister and they never married. They'd come through uh, World War One, World War Two, and the depression um, and they raised me. And I think they were, they were um, of Scottish descent and they were so brave in, the 19, in 1957, to take on a little Aboriginal baby in a small country town. Uh, and that baby had been born out of wedlock. So you would all understand the social um, pressures of that era. Um, and it imbued in me an incredible respect for older people. Um, and for all intents and purposes, my great aunt and uncle were my mother and father. Uh, it meant that I knew death very early in life because uh, by the time I was 13 or 14, our roles had, re had reversed and I was really caring for them. Um, and in those days, if you made it to 70, of course you were old. <laughs> Uh, very well, I, want, I want to come to that in a moment. Um, I yeah, but yeah I, and her name was Letitia Maud Lang, and uh, she, uh, I called her Nina. Nina. Well, I'm so glad that I asked you about her and, and we honour her memory today. But I also want to drill down, you know, this is an opportunity and a real privilege, Linda, to drill down with you a little bit into the meaning of that word elder that you referred to just now. It is so crucial and central to the Aboriginal culture. And as you say, we would do well to learn from that and to adopt um, those values into uh, our culture as Australians. But I want to ask you whether you've seen anything change around that notion of elder uh, within communities that you know and visit. And also I wanted to ask you how you achieve the status of elder. How do you get um, um, sort of, do you, how do you get the title of elder? And the same thing about the word auntie. Who gets to be an auntie? Everyone. <laughs> In fact, it's really interesting, Carolyn, because I've, I've, um, I'm 65 next birthday, and so I'm suddenly being called auntie, which I'm a little disturbed about sometimes. <laughs> but it's, it's really a sign of respect, um, and it applies to both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. But my for example, my surviving child, Willow, um, she uh, automatically calls people who are older than, who, you know, who are uh, in their 50s and 60s, auntie and uncle. It's a, it's a respectful, a very respectful sign. It's also something that you see in a lot of other cultures as well. Uh, your question about how do you achieve eldership? Well, it's a bit magic. Um, it's it, uh, there. There would have been rites of passage 
uh, in traditional culture and where that survived, I'm sure that's the case. But it comes in a very organic way. Um, it, it, it comes when you have displayed to your community a level of maturity, uh, that you're ready for it, um, and that you're ready in terms of the responsibilities it brings. It's not just about a title, it's actually comes with a whole set of responsibilities, your responsibilities to the broader community, responsibilities in terms of carrying that title, how you conduct yourself, uh, how you project yourself, um, and also a very high expectation about provision of leadership within the community. Right, so it's not something that one assumes lightly. And just to the second part of that question, Linda, have you seen any kind of erosion of respect for elders within no. the community or is that absolutely solid? And how, why? <laughs> um, the answer to your question is no, that I have not seen that. And I've been around for a very long time now. I mean, obviously, um, with colonisation and so forth, uh, a lot of the traditional ways in most of the country um, have broken down or been lost. But, for so, but, but somehow that notion survived mm. through all of the crap that's been thrown at Aboriginal people, through all of the challenges through all of the dreadful government policies it's uh it's probably the one thing that has absolutely survived well i think that's a great testament to the strength of the culture i want to ask you given the portfolio portfolios that you hold linda uh, what sort of strain you've seen particularly as far as older people um in terms of covid and the lockdown oh. you know, isolation obviously mm. um the virus running rampant through aged care but what has particularly struck you about the vulnerability of older people during covid um look that's a really great question so um one of the things that i've done in this office and I'm, I'm sure many others have done this as well uh, in fact I know many others have done it but my office spends every Friday uh, calling up each of my staff bring 20 people over the age of 60 in the electorate to see how they're traveling um, it's it's just a hello call and it's really, really appreciated. Most people say, oh, well, you know, my husband could do with a haircut. Uh, <laughs> um, but, and now and again, you'll get people that do need your assistance in terms of maybe scripts or uh, food parcels, but basically, it is most people look say look we're okay we're sick of it um, but thank you so much for for the call. I think the other the other thing obviously is um, really encouraging people, Carolyn, to uh, get a vaccination. There is hesitancy with older Australians, uh, and I think that had a lot to do with the bad rap that AstraZeneca got in mm. Australia. Um, uh, and um, making sure that people, you know, I've put out newsletters, I've done a lot of Facebook posts, um, knowing who, who to contact in a crisis. But generally, people are pretty resilient and caring for each other. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that, Linda, because we in our office at the Older Women's Network have also been ringing our membership 
and checking in with people and saying, you know, how are you traveling? And I'm finding that people who have some kind of routine, which involves going for a walk, for example, those or, or people who are uh, doing something that gives them a lot of pleasure, like gardening, mm -hmm. their mental health is good. One of the things that has really struck me in our membership, and I wonder how you feel about this, is that there is a digital divide. So you talked yeah. about posts on Facebook. I'm very struck by the number of older women in Australia who are afraid of engaging with the internet in terms of being afraid of scams, uh, worrying about whether their pension will extend to the cost of the internet. Um, and, and it has created, I think, a, a real isolation. It's emphasized mm -hmm. the isolation of lockdown. Is that something that you've noticed? I haven't particularly noticed it in relation to um, older women, but I, I absolutely have seen that. Um, just so that people understand that are online, the Cedar Barton um, has George's River Council, Bayside Council, and um, Canary Bankstown Council in it, um, which were, of course, the three of the 12 councils of concern. The digital divide has been with school kids. That it really has been huge in the sense that many families out this way are poor, they're big, um, and the availability of it's just impossible to even contemplate every kid having a, a tablet, there being a laptop in their home. Very often there's been an iPhone and you can't keep up schoolwork when dad or mum, um, who have, there's very few people that can work from home. Most people are on, um, most people are in very, unstable employment, um, contracts, uh, you know, surviving from food, hand to mouth, basically. Um, so we're doing a lot of work with the emergency organisations that are providing food hampers and their work has trebled. Yeah. Um, so the digital divide has been more with that I'm seeing uh, more with families that don't have the availability of screens, particularly for homeschooling. It's interesting because your perspective is your constituency and mine is much closer to home. I live with my 93 year old mother. And you know, when she sees mentions on television of how we're all going to carry um, passports or oh, I think apps for vaccination, yeah. she doesn't have a mobile phone. I mean, she's very savvy online. She does all her banking online. But she just looks at me and says, but how how will I get notified of where I can go and how I yeah. use an app? And she's never used a QR code. So I, I see that there are a lot of older people who it's just assumed that they have yeah. all these gadgets. And that well, they I, I actually think them. it's worse than that. I actually, sorry, I talked over the top of you. I actually think it's much worse than that. Um, but you are completely right. Um, and one of the things for, for people online to also understand that part of my shadow ministerial portfolio includes um, the age pension. So that's two and a half million people in Australia. Mm. Um, uh, what really worries me, and I'm so conscious of it, in the way that you've described it, is that there is an assumption that the whole of Centrelink can go online. There is an assumption that everything can be online. And that is just going to disadvantage older people more than anyone else. So it's not just about QR codes and vaccine passports. That's important. And, you know, you go to the supermarket and they, 
they'll have a sign in sheets for people that don't carry a phone. But is that going to continue? I don't think so. But it's the way in which government is moving everything to online, assuming that everyone has an iPhone in their pocket. And it's just not true. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, look, you've mentioned pensions there. We can't go further in this conversation with, without talking about this really important case in the High Court regarding Aboriginal Australians accessing the pension earlier because of the tragedy and the reality of a shorter life expectancy. Can you talk to us about your feelings okay. about this particular issue? So, uh, this is so timely. I had a briefing yesterday, all online, of course, I had a briefing uh, with the uh, Victorian Human Rights Commission, the Abri Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, and the lawyers that are actually running this case. So this case is um, the the, the uh, uh, person in it is a fellow they call Uncle Dennis. He's sixty four. Um, and he's, uh, it's going to be an amazing test case. Uh, uh, he's 64 and, um, as you've indicated, challenging the issues around um, from, and they're using the human rights perspective, challenging the issues around Aboriginal people accessing the pension. Well, it'll be soon 67 in Australia. Um, if the Prime Minister had his way, it would have been 70, but we were able to block that. Uh, I just see the age pension just being eroded or attempting to be eroded. And if there's any budget that tried to do that, we we're able to block all the measures, um, was the Abbott hockey budget in 14, 14, 15, was it? I think so, so, 2014, so, yes. So long ago, but it's still being felt, particularly around the age pension. So um, I was briefed yesterday by uh, this court case. What's interesting about it is that it's just beginning. So it will run over the next federal election. So uh, and the lawyers were worried that, they were, that the government would move legislation to do something to undo possibility of a positive outcome. I assure them the government won't do that because the government's kind of useless, really. But um, <laughs> I am, I shouldn't have said that. Um, and I just don't think that they would dare do it. It's a little bit like at the moment there's legislation in the House, uh, but it's just sitting there and I think the government would not dare to move it on a thing called the migrant waiting time. So what they wanted to do is move legislation where every, um, at every payment, disability, carer, child support, age pension, the new migrants would have to wait four years for all of those things, four, four years without any support whatsoever. That is sitting there at the moment. But I think that with the useless rollout of the vaccine in Western and Southwestern Sydney, they won't bring it on. Anyway, I'm off topic. Um, so getting back to this court case, so uh, my sense of it is um, remembering I'm in opposition is to let the court have its day and not intervene um, uh, and, and, and see what happens. At the moment, it's the government in the hot seat. If the government does move to put in legislation so that the court case won't proceed, then I'll have a decision to make. And my sense is that we would support the plaintiff, the um, 
proponent, but I, I haven't, I don't need to make a decision about it at the moment. No, no. It seems such a justified, such a reasonable demand, given the statistics, which, you know, it's incumbent on us to improve the life expectancy. But given the reality, this seems like such a just claim. I want to ask you, Linda, about the intersection between ageism and other prejudices, because that's where things get really, really toxic when ageism is combined with racism. So can you can you talk a little bit about your experience of that or about your concerns around that? I don't know that I've got a lot of experience um, in the sense that, um, you know, in, in my world, as we spoke about earlier, um, older people are absolutely revered and respected and listened to. Um, and that's been... That's really important for me in my role um, because, you know, I mean, I, it just drives me insane that people think that they've got to speak loudly to old people. <laughs> I mean, hey, they've been around for a while. You don't need to yell at them. They're not stupid. They're not silly. Um, and I've obviously visited lots of nursing homes. I had the wonderful experience uh, a few weeks ago of going to the 100th birthday of this guy that was just remarkable um, in one of, the, one of the nursing homes. So my respect comes from a very deep place. Mm. The intersection of ageism and racism does happen. Um, but I, I don't know that I can draw on a particular experience about well, that. Well, given then that you've got this kind of um, rather wonderful experience of your own culture where that doesn't happen, I wonder whether that means, Linda, that you were very shocked when um, some of the people who were taking part in the COVID debate in terms of public health were saying, well, the elderly we're going to die anyway, and they may just be collateral. And, and that's not unique in Australia. I mean, we heard that being said by politicians in uh, the UK. We heard that's it said true. in the US. We heard it said in many, many countries that, you know, if, if they're just going to get the virus, then we should just let them get the virus and we'll just take care of the younger people who, you know, will live longer and will fight it off. Did that really shock you? Yes. Um. It certainly did, and uh, it just devalues life. It devalues humanity, really, and I just can't relate to that at all. So there's another shocking statistic that um, I wanted to put to you, which is that um, which was not included in the recent Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. And that is that there are 50, I find this absolutely mind boggling, 50 sexual attacks taking mm -hmm. place in nursing homes a week. Now, I don't begin to know what the solution to that problem is, but is that something that you're aware of and um, is that something that you have a particular concern about? Um, I am aware of it and obviously it's incredibly concerning. Um, in my portfolio responsibilities, it, it doesn't come into my portfolio responsibilities, it comes into um, uh, the person responsible, well it's Mark Butler these days, so obviously um, it has to do with the employment practices of aged care facilities. Some of them are public and some of them are private. So it's the public ones that you can actually influence in terms of um, practice, but the private providers are a law unto themselves. And I think the regulatory Maybe the answer is that there needs to be something, a, a look at the regulatory arrangements to see, in fact, whether that issue is, uh, is considered in that. I suspect it's not.
Mm. How are you feeling, given what you were saying before about, you know, you don't need to talk more loudly to older people, you know, we're there, we, we get it. Um, how do you feel we're making progress or not in terms of the employment of older people, which is something very important? I think we are hopeless. <laughs> um, absolutely hopeless. Uh, you know, I, I look at, say, for example, I look at um, the uh, people employed in, in parliamentary offices. I mean, so many of them would have so little life experience and yet they're advising on things like the issues you're talking about, which is one of the reasons I do what I do. Um, so it just seems to me that, that Australia really needs to rethink from every aspect about um, older Australians. Uh, you know, the rhetoric issue must get, all must get so bloody sick of. Oh, the, you know, the wisdom, their knowledge and blah, blah, blah. Well, do something about it. Show people that that, what you, that is what you mean. And, you know, when you look at the public sector, um, the younger the better and I, I just personally I don't understand that but it is a, I think the, the broader issue that you're raising is it is a serious problem in Australia I can't I speak I can't speak about other countries because uh, I don't know but it is a problem here well I think it is a problem that's widespread, but other countries are being more progressive about the way that they address it. I mean, there has been some shift in attitude, apparently, towards, um, I think, an increase in, in numbers of people who think that, um, that um, older people should be retained and that they can uh, learn new working methods and that 55 is not old in the workplace, but 61 apparently is. So I wanted to ask you about that in relation to your uh, workplace in Canberra. So according to statistics, the average age of parliamentarians in Canberra is 51. So what is your experience of working in politics as a woman who is older than 51? Um, do you sense that, um, that that's a disadvantage? No, not at all. Um, That's a fantastic question. Um, personally, I don't find it as a disadvantage. I actually find it as an advantage. I'm probably one of the oldest people in the parliament. Um, I have some colleagues that are in their early 70s. Um, but, and I took a very deliberate decision not to go into parliament early when I was young. I could have, but I, I, I was 45 when I first stood for office. Um, and, you know, my, my, my kids were a bit older. Um, it suited, suited, suited me. And I find, and I can only talk about my side of politics, I find that the younger members of parliament really seek my counsel, which is lovely. That's good to know because, you know, I think it's interesting that you say that. I watched the film Strong Female Lead about Julia Gillard a couple of weeks ago. And then there was a follow-up online forum with Chanel Contos, uh, wow. the maker of the film, yeah. Posca Luby, Jess Scully from um, Sydney City Council an incredibly impressive group of yeah. young women. And the way they talked about calling out all the issues around language and sexism that Julia Gillard had had to endure, they were all using social media in a very interesting way to kind of um, 
you know, jump on any issue. And, and they had this incredible sort of network of support. But I did feel um, listening to their conversation, which was really bracing and intoxicating and very uplifting, that there was a sort of loss of memory that there were older women in the shadows and on the sidelines who were just waiting to be their mentors and waiting to be part of the same army. Now, when we saw the March for Justice in Canberra and everywhere else, we saw an incredible melding of generations. Everybody yes. came together, every color, every age was all together in that, in that march. But do you feel that there is a kind of divide between the younger generation who don't necessarily always call on women like you for advice? They're just reinventing the wheel because they've got new tools. Um. I've not thought about it like that, but I, I think you're probably probably right. Um, I can only draw on my own experience with my own staff where I, I found <laughs> quite annoying, quite frankly, that you sit down to have some food and the younger people, not the older people, but the younger staff members would have their bloody phones out during lunch and I just said one day I don't let my kids do it and you're not doing it if you can't wow. sit here for 20 minutes and eat a sandwich or a share of curry or whatever without checking your phone get out <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to ask you a very personal question we've been spending what about 40 minutes together it's pretty cheeky of me to ask you this so you can just tell me to go jump if you don't want to answer it but the big difference between you and I today um, is the color of my hair and the color of your hair. Um, Anna, this is a bottle. Yeah, well, that's what I'm coming to. So just <laughs> hang on while I tell you what I want to ask you about. The global hair color market is worth about three billion, thirty billion, sorry, thirty billion dollars US. That's a lot of hair color, and most of it is going to covering up gray hair. And I'm wondering whether you think that going grey is a political act and why so many women who are still in the workforce and prominent like you are, Linda, still colour their hair. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, OK, I will answer that question and uh, I'm getting a bit of a blush. So, my friend Juanita has gone grey and she's a little bit younger than me and she just looks amazing. Um, I don't think it's so much about going grey for me. It's a bloody process. It just would take so long. At one stage I started on the lightning, you know, but I have this thing about my hair uh, that... I have this reoccurring nightmare about twice a year that some of my I get my hair cut that I wake up crying. So, uh, and I am I do colour my hair. I've got very very grey hair. I don't think it's all over, but it's certainly around the front. And I've today the reason it looks okay is because I've had some crayon thing out. Do, Colouring it. So um, uh, I see my hair as part of my identity and it's long black hair. It's very long, everyone. <laughs> it is very long. It's beautiful hair. But I'm, I'm interested in this because I do meet women. I'm, I met a very high profile, very prominent woman. I'm not going to name her. At a function and she said oh I love your hair and I said when are you going to when are you going to take the plunge and do it and she said I don't dare and I thought what is it about grey hair that women are afraid of it seems to me having gone grey quite early on that it is interpreted as a sign that you are giving up you are giving up power you are giving up your um your place you are, you are saying, I am willing now to um, step back and become invisible. Go on, just yeah, look past I, me. 
No, I, I really haven't thought about it. Um, I, I think, well, what I've thought about, if I want to go grey, I'd have to get my hair cut really short. And I think that's more the issue than going grey for me. Okay. Okay. Well, look, thank you. Thank you for answering the question. <laughs> I'm just going it's to go to a couple here, of... <laughs> I'd say. <laughs> I'm going to go to a couple of the comments that we're getting in Not the everyone. Well, can I also say that yeah. some people like me, grey is salt and pepper, so it's not this beautiful, soft grey all over. That's different. Okay, okay. We're getting a lot of comments about this. I have to say that whenever I've uh, written pieces about grey hair, they get an incredible volume of response. And similarly <laughs> here, we're getting an extraordinary volume of respondents uh, from people saying, should we be having a discussion about this at all? Isn't that ageism? But that's <laughs> the point. That is the point that there is incredible judgment still, I think, around women's appearance in public well, life. I think that that, and for the people writing in, think about this. Blokes with grey hair are not judged. No. It is seen as a very positive thing. Women with grey hair, it's different. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that came out in the documentary about Julia Gillard was that, you know, a lot of the language focused on judgment of her appearance yeah. um, and it was toxic. It was absolutely toxic. It is naive to think that we do not live in a culture where image and representation are not a very powerful oh, part yes. of yes, how absolutely. you come across. You know, I mean, you know that you understand that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I um I think that's really a really important point. I know myself that I plan what I'm going to wear the night before, and I you know I, I like to look good, <laughs> so um I think it's really important. I think it is too. Uh, let's go back to slightly more serious matters, although I do think it is actually, it touches on a lot of serious kind of nerves. Um, as a lawmaker and having worked at both the state and the federal level, what can you tell us, Linda, about where older people sit in terms of priority for government? And also whether you think that these intergenerational reports that come out are really uh, an excuse or an opportunity to create artificial tension between younger generations and older people where they don't actually exist? Um, I'll, I'll go with the first bit. And this is going to be brutal, but it's the way things are polit in politics. Um, the cohort of older people and I know this network understands it, Council for the Aging understands it, as seen as a voting block. Mm -hmm. So whichever side of government um, values the, the vote of older Australians, uh, you will see policies reflected in that. Uh, I mean, I think think about the last federal election in Australia. Labor was supposed to win. We lost. Do you know why we lost? Franking credit credit. Yeah. That was one of the main issues because the other side was able to spin the narrative that franking credits would affect people on the age pension. It wasn't true. So in hard political terms, uh, there, are, there are a lot of votes in older Australians and that's what ultimately at election time uh, people, people pursue. But I think that in Australia at the moment there is a very important period of time you've had for the Royal Commission. Um, we've had the terrible uh, outcomes in nursing homes. Um, 
you have the issue that perhaps you don't see very much, but it's certainly a political issue of older Australians that are on the NDIS transferring to the age pension and therefore not being eligible for disability support. Um, and one of the discussions that I know Labor's having at the moment is what sort of political spend will be on older Australians and is it is it best to get aged care packages? Is it best to have a Medicare dental program? You know, it, it really is quite important. So I don't know if I answered your question. But. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the dental care because that was part of Labor's platform last time. And I understand that it, um, it's been dropped and I think it's such an important issue. So do I. It's, um, it's heartbreaking to see the condition of people's teeth and that teeth are not considered as important as the other, you know, the organs of the body. That argument's not over yet. Good, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Obviously you must be very concerned, Linda, about the fact that we know that the fastest growing homeless co cohort are women over 55. And clearly there is a huge need for more social housing in a completely overinflated property market where at the other end of life, at the beginning of life, many people, young people, can't expect to own a home. So can you give us um, a sense of your, um, your vision, if you like, yeah, on this um, particular issue? This issue, really has resonated polit politically. Um, and in the social housing package that Labor is taking to the election, which we've already released, uh, there is specific number, I can't, um, I can't off the top of my head remember, and my notes haven't got it, but they're in the social housing offering, which is 20,000 houses. There is a substantial number specifically earmarked for older women. That's because good to hear. It, absolutely, because of the issue that you've just highlighted. And um, Linda, are you finding that in the Indigenous community that there is a high level of engagement on these issues, particularly amongst older constituents, or do you feel that after years and years and years of being unheard and not addressed in terms of their own concerns, that people have disengaged from the political process and that you have to make an extra effort to persuade them that it is important to vote and that their vote matters? Um, it's getting better. Is it? Yeah, I think Why? so. Um, I think there is one of the reasons, well, your, your question's in two parts. One of the reasons is I think there is a greater recognition amongst the broader Australian community about listening to First Nations Australians. And if anything brought that to the fore was the bushfires last summer. Um, uh, the second issue that you've raised is the issue of voting, uh, which is incredibly problematic in some places. Uh, but I have found that older Aboriginal people understand better than younger Aboriginal people the importance of voting, and I think that's probably got to do with the fact that their own personal experience. I mean, I think I was about 31, 32. Uh, no, I was about in my late, late 20s. When I finally enrolled to vote, because prior to 84 or 88 or whatever it was, uh, Aboriginal people federally didn't have to vote. And I thought, well, stuff you. If you don't want my vote, you're not getting it. 
And I realized it was me that had the problem. <laughs> so I changed. Right. That's that's really interesting that you overcame you overcame that prejudice that you had against against the process. Yeah. I did. Okay. Um, we're just about out of time. I'm just looking at the comments that we're getting here. We've got um, someone, Catherine Branwell, is asking, are elders able to be any age group, presuming they've shown maturity and leadership? Or what's the, what's the starting point for eldership? There, there's no starting point, but it's, it's older people. It's not, it's not someone in their 30s or 40s. It's, yeah, it's someone in their late 60s, 70s, 80s. Okay, so that's that's already quite sort of advanced. You know, membership to the Older Women's Network is open to you from 55. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about the use of um, the term elder in non-Indigenous context? I love it. Do you? I mean, is that something that you allow us to appropriate or that you think to yourself, hang on, that's our term? No, neither. That's good to know. Okay, we've got a comment here from Richard Cody, who says, I've lived in Redfern for over 20 years and get uncle, get called uncle by younger people who are Aboriginal. There's no ageism there, just respect. That's interesting. Lovely. So again, that term auntie and uncle, that would cross over? Ah, oh, yes, yes. Well, that's very, that's a very generous attitude, which I think is exemplary and sort of um, demonstrates your generosity in, in your in your perspective to so many things, Linda. It's been great talking to you today. Thank I just want to much, um, close by saying that I really like what the great Chilean writer Isabel Allende says in her latest book, which is a small memoir called The Soul of a Woman, about her own experience of aging. She says, while my body deteriorates, my soul rejuvenates. I have become less angry. My character has softened a little. I do not fear my vulnerability because I no longer confuse it with weakness. I am in a splendid moment of my destiny. And she goes on to recommend lowering one's expectations, giving up resentment, and no longer faking it or lamenting the silly stuff. She says, we have to love ourselves a lot and love others without calculating how much we are loved in return. This is the stage of kindness. So I'm just going to ask you, Linda, how you respond to that. I love her. I love her work. And I think that this, the space and the place that she has described cannot be reached until you are, have been on this earth quite a while. So would you say then that in many ways that, that these are the best years, that these ripe, mature years can be the best years? Um, yes, they can. Okay, well, that's, that's, a, that's a good place to end. Um, the message I think that that is in so much of what you do. And just referring to Ashton, who sadly couldn't be with us here, but for those of you who haven't read her book, This Chair Rocks, A Manifesto Against Ageism, it is an absolute light bulb moment read, which makes you aware of your own prejudices and the terminology that you use and the behavior and attitudes that you unconsciously carry in so much of your life so it's a it's a really really fantastic book we hope that we'll we hope to get Ashton um back because really she's got so many great things to say about how to kind of further this campaign against ageism uh, but I think you know we have to free ourselves from our own internalized ageism before we can expect others to do the Absolutely. same Yes. I hope that um, you've all been inspired by this conversation with Linda today. Thank you so much for being with us and um, yeah. have a great day of the international older person, or I should say elder. <laughs> See you all. Bye. -bye.